Hey everybody, you're listening to the Comic Book Bears Podcast. I'm Billy Z. I'm Steve Morey. And I'm Brian Pitter. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Your ears are not deceiving you. Brother Brian is back with us it's for been this a minute. episode. It's yeah. Been to these days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell us so why it's been a minute. Days. We know, but people listening might not. So I work for, uh, let's just call it the man. And as part of my job, I have been traveling all over, uh, I would say all over the world, but really it's just, uh, Japan, uh, Hawaii and then a bunch of places in the United States. So, you know, it's not been the most uh, world, it's not a worldwide tour, but uh, I've been going at it since October. Uh, when was the last time I was on? Was it, it had to be like last year. It was, I think, late September or early October. So that tracks yeah. exactly when I started traveling. I have been in my house in here in Orlando probably a collective month since that whole thing started. Uh, and, and I mean, just, I've been everywhere. So, and I'm going back out. Uh, I'm going to see our lovely friend, uh, brother Matt, uh, in the Canada, except he's coming down to Seattle where I'll be. So, uh, I'm very excited to catch up with him, but I'll be back out on the road again for a little while. So, yeah, that's where I've been. It's been, uh, delightfully fun in some respects. I have never, had never been to Japan, and, uh, I have gotten to go to other scenic locales like Norfolk, Virginia. And Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> so, Ooh, you know. Jacksonville, exotic. Exactly. But no, I, I really have had a good time on the road. I just, when those people who travel for work, like for years, you have my utmost respect because I could not do this for another six months. There's no way. Uh, as much as it is enjoyable to be in a foreign locale, to browse the uh, spinner racks and comic book boxes and in, in new cities, to, you know, see the sights and enjoy the food and beer, especially I it's just too much. It's so much. I can't. I like having my things, as they say, yeah. and I uh, currently am surrounded and almost entombed by the collective uh, <laughs> loot crate boxes, comics that I haven't filed, bills and other correspondence. It, my my little uh, man cave is a wreck. Yeah. So anyway, but <laughs> I'm the, back. Those bills do them last. Oh, yeah. Do the fun stuff first. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, Brian, again, I'm somebody else who works in consulting, and I'm in hotels three nights a week. And a friend of mine just got the dream consulting gig where he's at the client site one week, and then he works from home the next, and then he's at the client site the next week, and he's home the next. I would love that. I would absolutely love that. I think that uh, after this, you know, last trip here, I think things will calm down a bit. But um, I do think if I had to make a sort of a hybrid of this schedule, it would be that. It would be out on the road for like a week and a half. I do like these. So I'm, I'm out usually like a week and a half to two weeks. Um, and I like that because then I get to see a little bit more of the area that I'm in because I at least have one or two days off. Right. And right. evenings. So like that helps. I like that. But um, yeah, being back home, at least to uh, center yourself, to see the animals and, uh, and and at least keep on top of your bills, it would be it would be preferable. So, yeah, that sounds like a dream gig. So you've actually been able to keep up with comics to some degree. I mean, so they have these digital uh, things now uh, <laughs> on the interwebs. <laughs> no, I, I actually uh, my ex, uh, Pat, actually has been. Uh, graciously keeping up with uh, purchasing the books from my LCS and then putting the codes into our shared still uh, Comixology app. So it's a um, it's nice every Wednesday, even if I don't have a comic shop to go into to buy books, I can at least pull up my tablet and read my Marvel books. Unfortunately, since DC is uh, whatever, um, I don't get to see those until I get back to uh, back to the the home front, but. Uh, I am caught up, and I can only say that um, I'm not really digging a lot of what's going on these days in Marvel, at least. Yeah. Uh, DC has been a lot more enjoyable for me. I think overall I'm very happy with everything. But, uh, yeah, my Marvel, the, the digital ones, the ones I get on the road, before, the ones I download right before I get on an airplane, uh, they're eh, <laughs> mediocre, mediocre at best. But uh, that's just me. Yeah. Uh, but I am I am caught up on at least that. I am nowhere near caught up on movies, television, 
I don't know, video games. I don't even know what else is there. Like I, <laughs> oh well, I haven't watched any of the like new DC Direct. Uh, what is it called? DC uh, All Access. Is that what oh, it is? DC Universe. DC Universe. I have really, really wanted to see Doom Patrol. Like mm-hmm. that is the one that I absolutely have to see, and I'm very excited. Um, but I, yeah, it's, it hasn't happened. So well, because you pretty much started all of your your massive traveling right around the time the Titans yeah. premiere. It's almost, or very close to almost it. right yep. then, yeah, yep. yeah. So yeah, there's. Uh, I think uh, at this point, uh, what would you say? We're just a little bit over halfway through on Doom Patrol. It's got about uh, a couple weeks left. Uh, it's up to it's up to issue, uh, not issue. Yeah, I'm not exactly nine, sure what the. It's a 15 episode season, yep. and yep. literally the week after that end, Swamp Thing starts. Exactly. Yeah. Ooh. So they're going straight into that, which is really good. Um, the one thing that I'm disappointed about, and Brian, I'm not sure how you feel about uh, about the series, but Stargirl, uh, we were expecting to be able to see this summer, but unfortunately, it's been pushed back into 2020. Um, but uh, we'll still get the second half of Young Justice. We're going to get uh, Harley Quinn. Uh, the new Harley Quinn animated series and, and the season two of Titans. Prior yeah, to yeah. Girl, yeah. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that starts around the same time as uh, as it did last year. Right. So I think that would that would really be good. And I think if they space out Young Justice more than they did with the first half of the season, I think you'd still get an original show every week. Yeah. With what they yeah. Had I mean, we haven't we haven't before. had a week. Uh, have we had a week since Titans started that there hasn't been? I At think there was one, one down week between Titans and Young Justice, and I mm. think that coincided with the holidays. So yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think you really felt that too badly. Uh, what do you guys? I know you probably talked about it on the show, so I apologize. What What do you think so far of both Titans and uh, 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 Doom Patrol? Especially knowing the budgets that these shows had to work with, mm-hmm. it is stunning the level of quality, just in terms of the, the, how the shows look. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not what I expected for the initial efforts from an upstart, what effectively is an upstart app. Right. Yeah. They look great. And I've had many, many grab-the-handkerchiefs moments already with Doom Patrol. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah and Doom, I think Doom Patrol is... Yeah. It, I, it, it hits a lot of... A lot of the feels, and especially the one that premiered last week, which we talked about in the last episode, which was probably the most LGBT-centric episode. Would you agree with that, Steve? Well, yeah, I mean, it uh, it, it definitely was very much front and center where, um, you know, identity and, um, you know, the concept of gender fluidity. Yeah. and It was the uh, first episode with Danny yeah. the Street. And yeah. it really hit, hit me very, very hard. And not not even in that, like, morose, like, oh, oh my life, my gay life way. And it was uh, – because so much of it was also celebratory that uh, it just really hit home on a lot of fronts. And uh, I, I think you're going to adore Doom Patrol. It's good. such a good cast. Yeah. Such I mean, just looking at the cast. roster, I was – I was already like, wow, this is uh, impressive. I would you call it uh, closer to like the Morrison era, or is it uh, the Gerard Way stuff recently, or is it's it just all over? It's like all over the map. I mean, it, it, it takes is, like the yeah. Silver Age stuff. It even took the Bronze Age stuff with one particular episode, the Morrison, the uh, the Gerard Way, and there's even elements from John Byrne's brief run. Yeah. Oh wow! That well, the, the, it the, all just coalesce into its own kind of uh, dynamic mm-hmm. well i think that I, I think the general like the general characters themselves seem very morrison-y but their their looks are it's a mix i mean the, yeah. the looks are completely a mix i mean you've got uh, a very gerard way robot man um and a morrison jane sort of uh and then rita far i mean obviously <laughs> who knows <Yeah>. really <laughs> um because she disappeared for such a long period of time. And this is – I really enjoy this version of Rita Farr. Oh, yeah. Uh, if not. It's the most fleshed uh, out version of that character ever. Well, yeah. And yeah. the actress – I think a lot of credit to the, uh, to the actress playing her. Yeah, she's wonderful. Belly, yeah. Um, 
but I think everybody in it is excellent. And, uh, y- you know, I, I, I want to say that the fact that most people watching this have no idea what to expect, uh, from this show that the expectations, um, you know, are, are so, <laughs> so fake that, uh, the showrunners can do whatever the hell they want. I mean, uh, to, to be honest, about this they've gone in directions that i didn't think i would ever see uh on a televised show like this it's really it's great and brian also get ready for a lot of potty mouth oh fuck yeah yeah, yeah. well <laughs> there's a lot in this brendan fraser alone is like yeah. fuck that fuck that. <laughs> this shit sucks you know like that's 90 percent of his dialogue is and when you do watch titans i think I think you may feel, as I do, that it was better than it needed to be. Oh. It really was a very strong debut. I, yeah, I think excellent. it was definitely the right property to debut that app with. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited for both. I really – I have not bought or whatever, you know, subscribed. I have not done that yet because I really – it's like CBS All Access. I don't pull the trigger on stuff until I'm ready to watch the thing on it. And then it's like if I'm doing the subscription, I'm going to, like, try to binge through as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Maybe cancel it, but usually I forget and it's just another thing. It's on my credit <laughs> card. But – uh anyway but yeah so i will uh you know when, when there's hopefully a nice quiet moment here or something really crazy happens and i hear about it i'll be like okay i guess i should watch it now. yeah and you're also in, from a comic book standpoint you're coming in at a good time whenever you do because they've just added thousands of books to the library oh excellent between the golden the uh, silver and the bronze age stuff and with newer material uh that will be added before the end of the month uh, it's basically DC's entire library apart from stuff that's less than a year old. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So um, they've got most of the events, most of the events from events, the past yeah. 30 years are up there in their entirety. Um, you've got whole runs of things. It, it's, it's really, it's expanded quite a yeah. bit and it's really only been since, uh, how long is it? Six months. It's been six months yeah. since it started. So and I never cool. thought I would get so used to reading comic books on the TV. <laughs> wait, 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 wait! You read them on the TV? Yeah, yeah. I I play it through the Roku and I read the comics on the TV. Is there a mobile? I'm I'm guessing there's a mobile version too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And it reads it reads just like uh you know any kind of um, standard comic app. Yeah. You know, on your iPad or or tablet or phone or whatever. Um, I I can't do the the TV thing. Oh, I I am shocked how easily I fell into it. I love yeah. it. I've tried it before. It's not really for me, but that's fine. That's why I have a tablet. <laughs> yeah, and I guess this is a good time that we can talk about the Disney Plus service and several oh, announcements today. They ju- just today. Yeah, yeah they yeah. just announced the pricing and the release date today. Yeah. Um, yeah. So six ninety nine a month or $70 for the year. So basically very similar to how DCU priced their app. Um, and it, it drops November 12th with two original series so the mandalorian is going to be on there and then something by Kristen bell uh some musical series for teeny boppers i can't remember uh much about that but i i mean they're they're looking to make as much original content as they possibly could they've got a a very aggressive um five-year plan Mm -hmm. and Given the acquisitions of the uh, 20th Century Fox Library and the National Geographic Library and some other mm-hmm. things, there's just so much content that they can just throw out right at the beginning. That's yeah. Uh, pretty, it's, a, it's pretty incredible. And some of the shows that they've announced, again, you've mentioned The Mandalorian, which is just finished filming, I understand. So, <laughs> so yeah. all those episodes are ready to go by the time that runs. Wow. Uh, they announced uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier and a Vi- Scarlet Witch and Vision series with a really awkward title of WandaVision. Yeah. And, and yeah, that was a little goofy. Uh, something called The Hero Project and also a documentary series. The and a Hawkeye different. show, too, I think. Yeah, yeah. That, that one's still in development, but uh, oh, yeah. that's going to be like a, a Kate-centered show, but with Jeremy Renner mm-hmm. as part of the cast. Yeah, lots of stuff. And I think they have the benefit here where unlike unlike the Disney – well, let's say unlike the Marvel TV shows that have been out, uh, even with streaming services like Netflix and Hulu – 
they have the benefit and the money to put cinema quality or the, you know, the same stars on the small screen mm-hmm. uh, in these shows. So we're in, um, you know, you might glance a uh, cameo in seasons past of uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. of somebody who was maybe a, a more minor player in one of the, uh, you know, the films. Uh, in this one, you're actually having the leads from the films uh, on their shows, or at least that's their intention for much of them. And obviously, you know, Scarlet Witch and Falcon. And like, I mean, it's all the same actor, so it's not like they're having to pussyfoot around the whole thing like they do um, they, they do with the Netflix series, uh, where they just kind of like mentioned offhand, hey, Captain America, the Hulk, these things happen. Uh, well, uh, you know, we're also in a different terrain now where yeah. you can get movie stars for TV series. It's where a lot of the creative juice is flowing. I mean, Julia Roberts, could you have conceived 10 years ago that you would have had Julia Roberts in a TV series? Well, and, and I think it's also working the other way around, too. I mean, we've seen a lot of people who start in pay TV, like HBO series and uh, and whatnot, making the transition to uh, feature films. Maybe not as successfully, but, you know, you're starting to see that, too. I, I just I, it, it's a very interesting time for this. And there's there's plenty of, uh, of choices when it comes to streaming streaming services. So, but Disney has the, they've got the, mem- you know, the money, the footprint, uh, and the power behind it to probably put Disney Plus on in a lot of homes. We're currently at uh, Star Wars Celebration time as well. So we have a lot of news that's going to be hitting over the next three days from that. Uh, do you know if Clone Wars, the season six, is that going to be part of Disney Plus? I'm not sure if they made any announcement on that. You know, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. But I haven't I haven't followed any of the uh, the other Star Wars information out of that besides Mandalorian. So, yeah. You know. uh, there's a, a video game that's apparently very interesting. The uh, Fallen uh, Order or something? Yeah, something like the, the Jedi Fallen Order, which it takes looks, place after Episode 3. It looks uh, like the time period is interesting because there's, I mean, there's, there's definitely media set in that time period, but it is sort of unexplored and... Uh, I wonder, doesn't uh, hmm. I know at some point between that and then the uh, original three Dark Forces Jedi Knight? What is that? Uh, shoot, no, it's not that one. There's been so many Star Wars games that I've played over the years. <laughs> the one that you were like the Darth Vader's apprentice, uh, running around doing his Force Unleashed. Force, Force Unleashed. Unleashed. Yeah. I really like that that game. It was sort of one of those first Star Wars games to really embrace the ridiculousness. Um, mm-hmm. But um yeah I'm I'm excited I I'm probably a bigger Star Wars nut than anything else uh star or something related. So when I saw the poster I got excited and it was just like ooh. Um plus they've been canceling a bunch of Star Wars games previously in development for whatever reasons mostly probably Disney just didn't didn't want it or didn't like it. So I'm yeah I'm thrilled with and, and we haven't seen anything. It's just a poster, right? So I'm yeah. holding my breath. Right. But there is a panel for it on Saturday. So oh yeah, I'm sure after this weekend yeah. we're gonna have all kinds of content. Yeah. 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 Well, and they've been uh, they've been pretty successful in bringing back a lot of the old video games. Um, Xbox is uh, you know Xbox has their backwards compatibility, and what they've been doing with a lot of older Star Wars games is bringing them onto you know so onto the Xbox One system um, with uh, some not a lot but some uh, HD enhancements. Um, so they've had a lot of the original Xbox games like uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2 just dropped last month, um, and it looks pretty gorgeous and apparently is um, very popular with people. Uh, they released KOTOR um, you know, maybe about a year and a half ago at this point, and probably the same people who bought it back when it was on the original Xbox and have bought it a billion times since when it was uh, put onto iOS or to Android or on PC or whatever, they probably... Like me, they bought it again <laughs> to play through the original. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're. I, I don't want to say they're they're recycling their old uh, successes, but you know they're able to do so at least on the Xbox platform or uh, on mobile. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're still selling. Like it's 
it's pretty amazing that people are probably from nostalgia for the most part or just hunger for a uh, a good new game. Now, I know Battlefront 2 is canon. Are the other games that you're talking about, are they like Legends Bannered or... Uh, I think that? KOTOR technically is, because um, it takes place in Old Republic, so it's really like, you know, it could be canon, it could not be canon, because it's thousands of years prior to uh, yeah. Episode 1. So, you know, they they could at some point come back and say, oh, this is actually, yeah, this is all in canon, we just haven't talked about yeah. it. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people would be really excited if Disney Plus announced a new Star Wars series based around the time of KOTOR, even... Having some of those characters. Yeah, I know a few people who are attending, and it seems there was, um, you know, a lottery system for a lot of the Funko materials and the Hasbro purchases and the panels themselves. And most people didn't really feel gypped. It seems people got something. No one was really shut out of anything, at least from people that I know. I'd love to go to a, to that one year celebration. I'd just go just for the swag. <laughs> I went when it it was in Orlando, like 2012, I think, and I had a great time. I didn't get to like do everything I wanted to do because it was just you know kind of crazy. But um, the the little con floor, you know, stuff, uh, all the vendors they brought in had some really cool stuff. And uh, I went to a couple panels, and one had like uh, Anthony Daniels, and one had like uh, oh gosh, oh uh, the robot chicken guys that were gonna do that Star Wars comedy that then immediately got shit canned when. Because this was right before Disney bought Lucas. Oh, right. Troopers. Troopers, yeah. yeah so yeah. they were they were showing stuff about that, and we're all like, yeah, it's great, it's great. And then Disney buys Lucasfilm, and like, all of it shut down. But, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm uh, I'm jealous. I definitely would love to go. But if, uh, if I'm still kicking around Orlando in, in August, uh, I'm working a connection to get me into the, the theme park because I really want to see the uh, the new – the new fancy uh, Star Wars world. Yeah, I have a feeling it's going to be like seven years before I get to that. <laughs> oh, I, I'm I'm really trying to find like a, a friend of a friend who can do like the soft open. You know, I'm sh- being in Orlando and knowing cast members. Like I'm I'm hoping I can figure something out. But yeah, it's going to be insane. It's, the whole place is going to be just lit for. And and that's you know as someone who lives here and you know, whatever it's cool. It's like uh, great. We're gonna have more tourists coming and visiting that means the airport's <laughs> gonna be jammed up and crazy and that means i'm gonna have flights to li- <laughs> <laughs> well i mean has the uh, harry potter uh blitz uh effect died down i mean it's only been I what five years i think years. it has at this point like i never perceived that like ru- rush of people so i don't know um but you advertised everywhere. Just, just it's so crazy. I yeah, just, I went to that, and this was before I knew you. When you know they they had the that main attraction before they outbuilt into the Jurassic Park area and all that stuff, and they had like there was like a a, a mummy ride that they just <laughs> reconfigured into a Harry Potter. I went on a good day. I mean, I I went on everything like God, like three or four times, like the Hulk coaster there. It's um, it's funny because. Those parks, depending on when you go and the time of year, can actually be very doable. But when most people would want to do their vacation, that's when everybody's there. So you really have to kind of find, like, these awkward times where there's just, like, a dead zone. And Yeah, I think it was early April when I went. Uh, see, yeah. that's, like, end of spring break. I guess spring break by that point is pretty much over. But uh, uh, that that actually does make sense then. It's uh, – Mardi Gras, they have like a Mardi Gras season that ends. It's before the graduation parties because there's a ton of that. Um, that's actually, like, I think, perfect. And the weather here is actually like not going to kill you. Um, but um, yeah, I, I've been there. I've, I'll tell you, I've been to the old Harry Potter, the first part, and that's it. I've not been to the new one at all. And it's been open for what, like five, six years. I mean, that's that's how frequently this person who lives in Orlando goes to those. Places. I haven't been to Disney in like six years it's 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 interesting um you just kind of burn out you're like all right that's good i don't need to keep going i remember there was one time i was going to go visit my grandmother who was sick there in the fort lauderdale area and it was during peak spring break and i could not find a car rental in the entire state of florida the entire state wow (laughs) that's um yeah, that's a thing. Yeah, it was a very much a last-minute trip, but I, the best they could offer me was to go into Georgia. 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, what, 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 what is that like? Go, yeah, go to Florida like, or Georgia. It's like, that's like hours away. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. Well, we're talking about everything but comics. So I, I, let me go to my good old reliable Steve. Steve, tell us about something you're reading. <laughs> Books. I don't know how to read. What are you talking about? Um, you know what? I'm going to start off with a DC book. And kind of like what I was telling you guys earlier is that um, I tend to be a little bit behind on my DC books because they come in giant chunks and piles uh, all at once. And then I have to kind of read through those. But one of the books that I have been keeping up with uh, as soon as it comes in is Wonder Woman. And uh, it's been, I think, since uh, issue – I think it was issue 60 – uh, maybe 58, uh, 58 or 60, where G. Willow Wilson started her run. And uh, Wonder Woman is still one of the bi-monthly books over at DC. Uh, so it comes out pretty frequently, and so there's a lot of chance there for, um, you know, for uh, G. Willow Wilson to go through and, and run a, a pretty strong story in several issues that you – don't feel like you forgot what happened at the beginning of it because, you know, she can wrap it up within a month and a half, two months and still have, you know, a good number of issues for a uh, for a trade. Um, so in the current uh, story arc, Diana is finding herself um, fighting the Titans. And if you haven't been following what's been going on uh, through the past several uh, issues since um, since she started on the book, um, G. Willow Wilson is is pretty much pushing um, this idea that something has happened to um, you know to the realm of the gods. So other gods have been somehow freed. Uh, Ares, of course, made an appearance kind of early on at the beginning of her run, um, where he gets directly involved in a uh, uh, in a Mediterranean country civil war. Um, we've got Aphrodite has now kind of joined. Wonder Woman's uh, immediate family, uh, and basically she just kind of runs around in a really long T-shirt uh, and no pants, um, and that's you know that's Aphrodite. Um, and then also some magical creatures who we've been kind of following as side char- characters, and they're they're actually a, a big hoot. Um, there's a, a, a Minotaur woman, a uh, Satyr, and a Pegasus. Um, and they befriended an immortal woman, and they kind of uh, make several appearances throughout the book, and and we kind of follow their uh, their sort of trip as uh, immigrants and refugees into America, um, and through that uh, we kind of get introduced to the next adversary that Wonder Woman's going to have to deal with, and so uh, with her Titans arc starting, um, I want to say around uh, issue um, number sixty six. Uh, right after Wonder Woman has uh, started her or finished her fight with Nemesis and decides to go on a journey to find out what happened to the realm of the gods, um, and uh, also along the way find Aphrodite's son Eros, um, she is uh, called in to aid uh, these magical creatures and their human friend out in the wilds of uh, Colorado and the uh, and the Rockies. Um, because giant mountain-sized titans have started attacking, um, and uh, it, it's it's pretty fun to see Wonder Woman really try to you know smash it up with these giant mountain-sized creatures. Uh, but she, even she feels that she's outmatched, and so she calls in the help of uh, who else but her longtime frenemy. Uh, Giganta, or Giganta, or Giganta, or whoever you want to pronounce it, I say. Oh, honey, challenge of the super friends, it's Giganta. Giganta. Um, who, of course, you know, she's part of, uh, she's part of on and off again Suicide Squad, uh, so she kind of borrows her from Amanda Waller's team, um, and, uh, Giganta kind of goes with her out to the wilds to help fight these giant rock creatures that have been popping up, um, and, uh, you know, they they have a pretty bad working relationship uh, throughout this issue, as you can see. Um, and uh, it, it's actually pretty fun. The expressions that Carrie Nord uh, draws on uh, on these characters is, is fantastic. Um, and uh, I think uh, who does the inks on this one? Um, 
Mick Gray with uh, Romulo Fajardo Jr. for the colors. It is fantastic. In fact, half the book is just sort of, you know, seeing how he's going to draw people's faces. It, again, not everybody's cup of tea, Gary Nord, but um, there's some great little moments and some, uh, you know, quiet asides in between the action um, that are pretty fun, like Gigantis' face when she realizes that she can't take this giant uh, rock titan that's even bigger than she is. Um needing Wonder Woman's help. And then of course, Wonder Woman flying away with, uh, some beer bellied redneck, um, who of course, uh, is showing his plumber's crack and, uh, uh, and belly button, uh, randomly. Cause he's just, you know, being thrown around by this awesome Amazon. Um, the really fun thing of course comes at the end, which is a little bit of surprise. That was, a, would say, uh, kind of broadcast a little early on in the book. Um, and actually, I think in issue number 66, uh, that, of course, something was going to come up, especially with these side characters that we followed into this area. Um, and it uh, looks like uh, issue number 68, which I believe is out this week uh, or next week, um, should uh, either conclude it or be close to the conclusion for this uh, for this arc. But it's a lot of fun. I, I recommend it. If you haven't been reading Wonder Woman or even if you haven't picked up any of G. Willow Wilson's run, it's a lot of fun. She has definitely a great time with these characters um, and bringing in a lot of other references with, uh, you know, semi obscure gods, but then also some of her, you know, historical adversaries and historical uh, god characters. But I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, I especially love Gigantas negotiation skills when she's <laughs> trying to terrible. determine what she's going to get out of being involved with this and <laughs> how much like, you going to give me. <laughs> you know, do you uh... know how much I eat? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's nice that there's a lot of lighthearted moments, particularly yes. with the creatures as they're entering the woods. There were some laugh out loud lines. Oh yeah. Well, I mean those those uh sort of mascots i, I want to call them mascots because they've been you know right from the beginning of wilson's run on this she's had them on you know even just a couple pages here and there issue you know in each issue but they always have some really good gags they have some great dialogue and the reactions and what they're being taken through obviously it's a side you know it's a it is a pretty you know snide commentary on you know, what it's like to be a refugee or an immigrant um, and, you know, the the experiences that they have. But it's kept lighthearted. So it's not like, a, you know, it. I know some people get kind of uh, put off by overly preachy or, you know, um, you know, very, very in your face kind of uh, social commentary like that. But this is actually done in a way where, you know, it's it's obvious what she means by it. But at the same time, she keeps it lighthearted. So, um so you don't feel kind of, uh, you know, lectured at while you're reading, if if people out there are concerned right. about that. And I think through Wilson's run, there have just been these nice little nugget moments of uh, stripped-down humanity. Like yeah. that moment with Steve Trevor when when Diana finally went to sleep, and mm-hmm. Steve was shocked that she sleeps like a log <laughs> and <laughs> snores, you know. I just I just love those little bits that she throws in there. And she certainly has an understanding of the character. It feels like you could have taken this Wonder Woman from any previous run. Whatever your familiarity was, there was no deep reinvention of the character. It's yeah. just basically this is Wonder Woman and these are the stories we're going to tell. And I also really liked when they do talk about something being broken within the God realm, that it mm-hmm. isn't just restricted to the Greek gods. At least that intention is there with how they brought about the information about the Titans and whether these are actually are Titans. And, yeah, and I, I thought it was really handled well. That's And that's actually a really good point. You know, this, I think, kind of gives the uh, impression that the world uh, that she's kind of um, creating here is going to be a little bit larger beyond just the uh, Greek pantheon. Um, but, you know, I don't want to spoil too much because they they do uh, pretty much break that uh, on the last page of issue 67. So um, but, yeah, I, I've been really enjoying her run. Um, I think it was off to a slightly slow start. It felt like the first arc went 
went on for a little bit, but at the same time, it was still fun to read, filled with those, you know, human moments, especially between Steve and Diana um, and when Steve was actually on the page. Uh, and there was also one, I want to say, an issue maybe 65, uh, which was, uh, you know, part of part of her, her conflict with um, uh, with Nemesis, uh, where Aphrodite and Steve talk. And it's a great, you know, great little insight into how Wilson sees uh, the relationship between Diana and Steve. So pretty it's it's pretty good. It's really it's enjoyable. Um and uh, I think if you've been enjoying Wonder Woman or have enjoyed Wonder Woman in the past, you know, ten years, uh, you should be giving this arc a arc a look see and uh, enjoying it. Okay, Traveler of the Pacific. What have you been reading? <laughs> so have you guys talked about uh, Wonder Wonder Comics uh, or at, uh, no? Sorry. We Wonder actually Twins. been we actually been holding all the Wonder Comics talk. Yep. So if you want to hit Wonder Twins, please do. That's okay. So good. That's um. I have not read any of the other Wonder Comics, so I am I am excited to after hearing Bendis talk about it. But um, thus far, uh, I picked up Wonder Twins because one of my favorite writers, Mark Russell, uh, is writing it. And um, I was wondering what he was going to do after his uh, Jesus book at DC kind of got not picked up or, you know, however that all went down. So I was like, oh, he's doing Wonder Twins. This is great. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Wonder Twins um, – you're obviously uh, a millennial. No. Um, I mean, even then, I feel like that they're so maligned over however many years of uh, Harvey Birdman or memes. I don't know if they've been memes, but they probably have. Uh, other, other like, you know, parodies of the Wonder Twins. By now, I feel like it's you – know, people know who the Wonder Twins are. It's, uh, oh, God, I'm going to screw their names up. Jan and – Zan and Jaina. Oh, God. Wow. So I totally mixed those two up or merged those two into some weird uh, gestalt. So uh, these two uh, little little moppets were uh, and Bill, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I could totally be cur- uh, creatures uh, from the cartoon. Uh, they had not previously existed in the comics. Is that Oh, correct? no, no, no. There have been oh. versions of these two within the comics at various times. They've never well, been. I meant- Really big characters. Where did they start? Okay, they started in 1977 when the Super Friends was revived as the all-new Super Friends Hour. Okay, that's what I was referring to. So, yeah, they they came from Super Friends. Right. uh, But I did not know it was when they revived Super Friends. Right. The original Super Friends, they had these teenage mascots, Wendy, Marvin, and Wonder Dog. That was in 1973, and the cartoon just kept getting shown and shown with no new episodes until 77 when they did do the all-new Super Friends Hour. At the time, a very big teen duo was Donnie and Marie Osmond. So you have like a lot of influences from that with the purple and the hair and the nice teeth. And they did appear in a Super Friends comic that ran from the late 70s to the very early 80s. And they later were incorporated into the DC Universe in a really terrible series called Extreme Justice. Oh, uh, my God, that's right. So, yeah. So they have been around, and uh, there's been appearances here and there. One really funny incorporation of them into Teen Titans Go, if you've ever seen that. But this is this is really, I think, the first time since Extreme Justice where there's been this attempt to really align them within the, the working universe. So I'm thank you for that background because like I knew pieces and parts, but that's that's a much better and more thorough overview. And so like again, maligned, made fun of, they're kind of ridiculous. But of course, Bendis, uh, as I heard on the word balloon uh, thing, was like, no, we're totally bringing him back. And basically, I think asked Russell uh, to pitch uh, the, the his take on it. And Mark Russell, you know, I'm sure he was familiar with them in some small way. But as is usually his uh, his way, he he comes to the material from outside and kind of, you know, takes it on as his own and finds a way to channel his own unique, um, let's call it social commentary and satire. I think social satire uh, into the work. So whether it be Flintstones or, um, oh, my God, what's the what's the. The Panther. Oh, uh, Snagglepuss. Snagglepuss. Stage left Snagglepuss. Right. Um, or even Prez prior to all of that. Um, even, I guess, he's doing some work uh, over at Dynamite. He's done 
uh, he's doing Red Sonja right now, and he did uh, the Lone Ranger, and again brought this sort of sort of similar sort of style to it. Anyway, great writer, he's he's killing it. So no exception here. There's been I think two issues out. I may have if there's a third, I may have missed it. Third just came out yesterday. Okay, then I missed it. I gotta go back to my store. Um, and it's again, it's DC. It's in continuity ish. But, like, it's a lighter version of some of the uh, superheroes that we have known uh, come to come to love. And the comedic uh, timings of his his writing are are very present in this in this uh, in this tale. Uh, Basically, they bring the uh, the 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 dynamic duo. Not really. But they bring the two uh, brother and sister into the Hall of Justice, uh, which is now, you know, a thing again in the modern Justice League uh, stories. And they're kind of like interns. They're kind of like, you know, learning and helping out and junior, very, very, very junior members, uh, you know, just to just to kind of give them a, something to do after school. And um, the art by Stephen Byrne, who I always enjoy. And every time I see his stuff, I get I get very excited. It's really just it's it's cartoony without being too ridiculous, but conveying this lovely, like light sensibility um even in some more dark material um again perfect pairing for these guys uh to partner on this book and uh yeah it just it's it's just ridiculous it's totally ridiculous the first issue kind of just sets the stage you learn about the uh the thunder was it called the thunder the thunderstorm basically they're they're aliens their home planet um whenever they have this really bad lightning storm uh, that they call the thunder. Oh God, I can't find it here. The uh, it, it makes them all uh, go into fits of uh, of lust, and they have to immediately start procreating or doing whatever that you know might be like uh, for fun. Um, and so, uh, oh God, you just said their names. Zan, uh, Zan and Jane. The brother is. Yeah. Think Zana. of me. Think of me, Zan. Okay. Zan. And then yeah. Jane. Yeah. Okay. So Zan, <laughs> uh, for some reason, is highly affected by this. Um, and, uh, you know, they have a little lovely beat about uh, this happening while he's at high school and, and kind of has to go off and take care of things. Um, and he's just trying to be Mr. Popular, and it's just the whole thing. Um, so they do, of course, you know, stay true to the characters. They have this ability to activate their superpowers um and uh they can only do it together uh when they they activate their uh, wonder twins powers and of course you know uh they they have different powers uh that that some are more useful than others uh zan's powers turn into different forms of moisture which is you know i guess sort of useful at times and jaina's power is a little more uh traditional like transforming into different creatures and whatnot so so like it's it's uh it's an interesting kind of uh idea um and the first issue is kind of lazy groundwork second issue is where i think it really starts to take off and do more of the social satire you get um a story about a a villain and i'm trying to find his name but he basically is in prison in a lexicon private prison and so that is of course like lexcore and so basically you find out that lex luther is uh, oddly enough uh, privatizing or, or the, the contractor for a privatized prison sent, uh, prison uh, series or prison uh, prisons, and uh, the whole story is about this uh, this one villain. I think they call him the Scrambler. He can basically like take places, he, like body swaps uh, at will with whoever he wants, and it's all about as the, as the, the the Wonder Twins are going through the prison to take a tour with their school. It's about their kind of reaction to seeing the, the, the treatment of these prisoners. And then it's about this, uh, this, the guy, the scrambler kind of hooking back up with very, very, very farm league, um, uh, doom patrol or doom patrol, sorry, uh, legion of doom. So, you know, hijinks ensue. There's some very, um, Oh gosh. Uh, the Spider-Man villains book, uh, the the superior foes of Spider-Man, if you guys remember that, there's a little bit of that vibe going on in some of these more ridiculous supervillains, uh, including one called Druncula, and I think that's not his actual name. That's the nickname they gave him because basically he's an alcoholic who's a vampire. I loved that character. 
<laughs> I great. love that character so much. And it's 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 Mark Mark Russell is funny, but there is a serious, absolutely like dark sort of idea that they explore with that character, and with this whole issue with the whole LexCorp prison uh, privatization. I mean, it's God. I I we were talking about you know the the G Willow Wilson and how she's able to make. Uh, some of the satire, not satire, some of the social commentary, uh, not be preachy, which I I hate. I hate thinking about things being preachy, but I I get it. But like they do it is such a nice sweetness and light, and using these tropes and characters that you know most people think are just about punching each other and wearing crazy outfits and being ultra violent, and they transform that into something that actually can convey a a powerful message, and you see this over the course of comics. I mean, this is not a new thing at all, but in the modern era, I can't think of any any better example than these two writers for uh, for for creatives using this medium in a way that is, you know, conveying a, a, a very interesting and important social message. So I I think Wonder Twins is great. You can hand it to a kid. I mean, I don't know if Wonder Comics is expressly for children. I mean, it's not for children, but like. I think I think kids would uh, if of a certain age, maybe ten or more, ten or older. I think they would enjoy uh, the broad strokes, and you know, honestly, some of the kids would totally get it and and love it. Um, so I I love Wonder Twins. I'm very happy Mark Russell is at DC and doing some amazing work. And uh, you know, as much as I, you know, I love this take on uh, Flintstones and uh, Snagglepuss. I think this this given the uh, the increasing, uh, you know, profile that he's got. I think this is, there's only more to come and and more amazing stuff down the road. And yeah, I I love it. I'm so thrilled. If you haven't read this yet, you got to do it. Mm -hmm. I've been really impressed across the board with the wonder comics titles. It feels like Bendis with him writing young justice and co-writing Naomi. He just, it just feels like he's like energized again. And there is like, I don't want to say like an early ultimate feel to it, but it does have that same sense of enthusiasm. The other book that we should mention there is Dial H for Hero, which is written by Simon Humphreys. And I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the artist's name, but he was really good uh, cartoonish sort of artist. Um, but the Wonder Comics line is teen heroes geared for for a teen and plus and beyond that audience. Uh, Quinones, I couldn't think of his name. Oh, uh, Joe Quinones, yeah, yeah another Joe Quinones, fantastic yeah. artist, perfect. Though. Yeah, this uh, w- version of Dial H for Hero takes a lot of cues from the original Silver Age version. There's some other stuff. I mean, the last version of Dial H was the China Melville written, which was Vertigo without having the Vertigo trade dress on it. Um, yeah. So it's nice to see something along these lines that is really youth based because that's a property that it started as youth based conceit and this issue has is shown me that's where it probably should stay. But I've loved everything so far from Wonder Comics. Steve, you've been reading them all, right? Yeah, I haven't actually uh, picked up – well, I have it, but I haven't read it yet, uh, the Dial H for Hero. And see, I actually really enjoyed the um, New 52 version of Dial H, but it was completely off in its own its own little category. It, like you said, it's Vertigo without the, without right. the dress. There was one minor crossover with the Flash, but that was it. Yeah, and, and that was more just to – I guess just to make – make it have some kind of relevance to the greater universe. Cause really it, it, it didn't. Um, but I, you know, I like China Mievel's stuff. Uh, his, um, uh, prose books are, are some favorites of mine. So I was really excited to see him draw, uh, you know, write that. Um, but I'm also really excited for this. I remember reading dial H like the dial H, um, you know, uh, sort of, uh, secondary stories in old issues of stuff that I would, you know, dredge up in um, in yard sales and, and right. quarter bins and things like that. So mostly in New Adventures of Superboy. It, exactly. And it's all, you know, it was very, um, you know, geared towards a younger audience. And but it was still fun. It was it was fun. It was exciting. Didn't they used to uh, have sort of contests for readers? Yes. So they could come up with their own superhero. Yes, and the character and then they would you created would be drawn it. into the story, and you yeah. would want a T-shirt. 
Yeah, which is awesome. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and this this kind of, you know, the fact that they're bringing back more of that feel. I mean, it would be really awesome if they did that sort of, like, contest thing again, which they probably won't. Right. But, um, but I do have know. to say, with the first hero that they've introduced, Monster Truck, which is something <laughs> that could have leaped off of a Cyber Force cover in 1995. I love that that's the first thing that, that, that this guy, this Miguel, this new um, holder of the dial, that that's what his mind conjures up. Yeah, I'm really impressed with the whole line. Uh, and Naomi, I think, is, you know, it's, it's a mystery more than anything. This firmly takes place in the DC universe, but what about the areas that are not Metropolis or Gotham City or New York City? What about the smaller towns? What's it like there? And especially what's it like for a teenager there who may have a connection to other characters that she's unaware of. Been some really good stuff. And Steve, I think you so far are really digging Teen Lantern. Yeah, I think it's a it's a cool concept. It's fun. Yeah, which is part of Young Justice. Yeah. Uh, which also throws a, a lot of uh, influence from uh, the 80s series Amethyst, Princess of Gemworld. So far, which I loved. You know that factors in heavily with the <laughs> at least with the initial storyline. Hey, hey, I want I I bought all those new Fifty Two Amethysts uh, that that short lived Amethyst series. Um, loved it. So um, <laughs> this has been very fun for me. Wonder Comics has. So. <laughs> okay, so you two have talked about DC books, and I'm the DC guy, so I'm not going to talk about the DC book. Uh, one book I want to mention is the first issue of Glow. From IDW, which is a tie-in with the Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling series that is on Netflix. And the writer for the series is Teeny Howard. I think this is one of her last projects prior to becoming a Marvel exclusive. The art is by somebody I've never heard of before, Hannah Templar. And the feel of the book, imagine classic Archie mixed in with classic Love and Rockets. It has that cartoony yet adult feel. The storyline is kind of secondary. You know, basically, the Glow Girls are ahead of schedule in filming. Uh, it takes place before they go to Las Vegas, but you don't need to know that. That happens at the end of season two. And all the characters are there. I would love original art with the way that they depict Sam Sylvia Mark Maron's character in the show. It's just, it's just really cool. Basically, the storyline is uh, they have a little bit of downtime, so they're going to appear live at a wrestling fest. And they have to raise money to get there, which includes Britannia joining a trivia uh, night contest. And they're just doing everything they can within the characters that they use uh, to uh, make this trip happen. And the opponents that they are going to face are a group called the Star Primas, which by all indications might be like a female luchador version of the Glow Girls. So if you dig the series on TV, this is a, a wonderful ancillary project. And uh, I'm digging it a lot. Again, that's Glow, and that's uh, published by IDW. I didn't know about Teeny going over to Marvel. That's awesome. Yeah, she <laughs> signed as a Marvel exclusive this week. That's fantastic. So I saw her. Oh yeah, we were, we were together, right? Oh yeah, we, yeah, at Heroes last year. So that's uh, so cool. I'm so happy for her successes. And she's, you know, she's been on uh, a lot of, I would say, like some independent projects, but she's also been on some high profile licensed stuff as well. I mean, obviously she. You know, last year she was doing the Captain America annual, um, but she was also doing uh, Power Rangers. Yeah. Um, and, and I think one of her I, own. I've heard that her Power Rangers is like the best Power Rangers comic yeah. ever. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's the best Power Rangers comic ever. <laughs> yeah. So after reading 51 DC comics, I'm the opposite of you, Steve. I get my DCs in a big bundle, but I blow through them. I needed to sprinkle it with something a little bit, uh, a couple steps removed from that. So, well, do you guys want to get in another quick book before we do woofs, or? Yeah, let me think? complain about a book. Is that okay? Oh well, actually, God, Steve, yes. Steve, yes. you've probably got a, a positive. Let's. I don't know which which is better. <laughs> do we do we want a positive or a negative? I think we should go with your negative so we can end on Steve's positive note. Okay, oh, I like oh, that. That works. Yeah. So. Sure. 
Did any of you get to read Major X yet? No, it's in my next box, though. Can I say no because I have absolutely no desire to read it? (laughs) So I was not going to buy this book. And Pat, I guess, because of his comic book uh, history and loving X-Men from the 90s and da-da-da-da-da, he he picked it up. That or our LCS just thought, you know, hey, we're reading every other X book, which, by the way, pretty much are all awful. I'm just going to put that out there. Uh, Uncanny being the pleasant exception, but whatever. And, oh, hold on. Can we take a quick moment to just thank the God above and God below that we have Jonathan Hickman writing X-Men coming up? Is that <laughs> not? I figure you oh. would be very happy with the announcement of those 12 I issues. Bet, yeah. I about wet myself. I, 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 well, you know, longtime listeners of the show, or, or those of you who don't know, I'm a huge Jonathan Hickman fan, and I have been wondering, other than the occasional, um, you know, odd book he puts out, uh, you, you know, if he's going to, come back to one of the big two and there were rumors of course of him doing uh uh what's it, the the league not the league the legion sorry um at dc for a while and then i guess they tried to he went over to marvel and there were rumors about him coming to x-men and he said very publicly he's like i would do x-men like nobody's business like he's now i'm a little scared because i feel like now finally like all the pieces have been put back they brought cyclops back i think while i was on travel and just that that made my day, even if I thought the the execution was a little mediocre. But um, yeah, I'm I'm very happy about all that. So uh, big X Men fan. If you didn't know, I'm a big X Men fan. So Major X. Let's let's uh, let's just uh, yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know Rob Liefeld, uh, he's a comic book creator and uh, very popular in the '90s, uh, I would say, and uh, part of the Image Revolution. Did uh, Young Blood? Uh, I guess before that. Famous for his uh, X Force, created the characters of Deadpool, and uh, well, visually styled, let's say uh, half the battle for uh, Deadpool and Cable, uh, Domino, I think, uh, God, Stat- Shatterstar, like a bunch of the iconic padded GW Bridge, GW Bridge. Oh my God! So Lightfield has a thing for for patches, uh, pockets, and pads. And his anatomy, well, let's just say he's not great at uh, proportions. And uh, for whatever reason, it's like he doesn't think ankles really exist. I've never figured that out. But, you know, all these things are tropes. So, of course, out of nowhere, surprising, I think, everybody, or most everybody, the Marvel announced this book, Major X by Liefeld. And I'm like, what? And we're doing this. Okay. And I guess it's in continuity. I mean, it doesn't really fit right now because of everything going on. You've got old man cable and that kind of doesn't exist now, but whatever it, it, it's, it's set in the past. I think that's the, uh, the, the way they're explaining it. So I, uh, I get this, I get back from wherever I was and I see this sitting on my stack. Cause I think I waited, I didn't go to the digital books. So I, I just decided I'd wait and see what was in my, uh, in my poll. And I start going through it because I'm a glutton for punishment. And because I also was a kid of the 90s, I grew up buying way too many copies of Image Number 1s uh, back before they really were worth anything. Um, and I started reading this thing. And I don't know. It's very Liefeld-esque. I mean, let's just, it is what it is. If you, if you like Liefeld, uh, if you enjoy that style of bombast, uh, it's it's definitely a thing out of another era, but uh, you know it's it's I think it for for Liefeld some of it actually looked really good, uh, other parts um, less so, and uh, the story doesn't quite make sense yet because I think there's a bit of a I mean there's time travel involved and there's some there's some other stuff going on there's a a place called the Existence I can't make that shit up, mm-hmm. <laughs> but Liefeld sure can and to the bank i mean the dudes definitely doesn't have to do a lot of work anymore but um but i mean i think the biggest like issues i have there there are certainly pages i'm looking at one right now which i could send a picture to you the listener over your ear 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 holes um there's a page with just an entirely white background and a motorcycle driving up the panel on the left now I'm not opposed to creative storytelling choices. Uh, Some of my favorite artists uh, do that. Steranko, obviously. Um, Akko, not too long ago, famous for some really interesting panel designs and all that. 
But I think this is just lazy, honestly, because there's a lot of white on that page. And the motorcycle and, and, and oh, oh, and by the way, Beast is in it, but he's some kind of weird albino devolved beast. But yet he's like and he's got like an outfit on, but it's painted on. It's painted on his fur, which sounds kind of hot, actually, but it's totally not at all. It looks it looks weird and awful. I, I just don't like it. Um, and then you've got a very yellowed out looking Wolverine from the uh, era, possibly now, but I think it's set prior where he had the uh, the brown and yellow. And he looks it just it just looks wrong. It's like the wrong. And that's a colors choice. I don't know if Liefeld did the colors. I he could have. But uh, let's see who did the colors. Uh, oh, Rom- Romulo Fajardo Jr. I don't know a lot of colorists, so uh, maybe they're well known, but uh I don't like the choices. Uh, cable looks odd and sort of like a pastel looking kind of cable. It, everything just looks wrong. So maybe there's a storytelling choice here. Maybe there's a reason everything looks wrong. But the real, I probably the biggest sin of this whole thing is the reveal at the end. And I am by no means like, I don't have to spoil it for you. Uh, I feel like part of the audience would be like, oh no, we don't want to, we don't want to be spoiled. We want to, we want to see what happens organically, and we want to experience this ourselves. But I don't think uh, you two care, right? Uh, no, I already know. Okay, good. So, yeah. Uh, Steve, Spoil okay? away. I'll never read yeah. it. <laughs> uh, so the character of Major X, other than looking like a fucking stereotype of a 90s creator, creation, of a, cre- a 90s creator, uh, he has a helmet. And guess what his helmet has on it, guys? An I'm not going to guess. Does it have an X on it? Not just an X, it's a red X on a oh. black helmet. So I'm thinking, like, dudes like Cyclops, you know, from that, uh, not, I, I never hated that costume, but uh, the, the costume where he had the X mask that, you know, I guess you could see out of. Um, oh, and by the way, real quick aside, Deadpool has um, shoulder pads because everybody fucking has shoulder pads. That's how it was in Liefeld. That's always how it is in Liefeld. You go to all of his stuff. I don't know why you love shoulder pads so much. Like, I, I think there was an era where shoulder pads – they kind of made sense. You know, women had them to maybe give them a little height and, you know, straighten. I don't know. But but he watched why? a lot of Dynasty. What can you say? Well, he doesn't like to draw people turning their heads. And so what better way to make an excuse that they can't turn their heads because their shoulder pads are way too big? I like that idea a lot. I think there's, there's credit there. I also can't imagine. I don't understand why Cable has a collar. Cable has a fucking collar. Why? Like, it's like a choker <laughs> collar. Like, did he get into, like, puppy play at some point and no, we didn't know about it? Like, oh, they can have different costumes. It's okay. I just, it's a bad, it's a design choice. It's a design choice. I don't like it. It's a bad choice. Anyway, so you're going through and he's got the helmet on. He won't take the helmet off. The helmet's on the whole damn time. Up until the very end when you get this little Brady Bunch-esque you know, six panel shot of the heads uh, of the busts of all the X Force. Uh, well, not all the X Force, but you have X Force and uh, da- uh, Deadpool. Actually, Boom Boom's not in this for some reason. And uh, you get Cable standing there looking all weird and sort of a half profile shadow thing. I-, I mean, it's like it's like that one page. It's like Liefeld didn't draw. Like uh-huh. it does not look like Liefeld's art. Anyway, and on the last page, it is revealed, and I'm going to read you the, the bubble, the the word bu- word balloon. My name is Alexander Nathaniel Summers. I have risked everything by contacting you at this point in your history, Father, talking to Cable. You are my last, best, and only hope. It's like, fucking seriously. Like, the, the whole thing wasn't bad enough, you know, with the, the 90s steeped nonsense. And then the, the most tropey thing of, of tropes, Luke, I am your father, or whatever, uh, in this case, uh, hey, you know, I'm your son. But then his name, Alexander Nathaniel. So, I mean, Cable's Nate, Nate Nathan. Right. And so, Alex, Alex is uh, Havoc, right? Right. Right. Mm-hmm. So so really, you're going to name your kid A after you a- and your um your 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 uncle and your dad, I guess, because he's got the last name. But I mean, like what? It's bizarre. Now, now I will say that is the uh, that is the what do you call it at the end? That is the uh, the shocker, the, the cliffhanger, the reveal. We don't know much beyond that. There could be other hijinks involved. So that yes. would make him Hope's brother or half brother. Well, Hope isn't like Hope's like adopted daughter, right? 
Yeah, I don't okay. think she's blood related. She's not yeah, blood she... related. Okay, all right. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't know how you follow X Men stuff. It's so oh my god. It is. No, it totally is. But I, given that, given that, that's right. She is adopted. Yeah. There are ways to make X Men comics really fun. And right now, like I said, Uncanny X Men by uh, Rosenberg actually is really good. I'm kind of. I'm excited for Hickman, but I'm kind of sad that, that Rosenberg's not going to get to do a little more. I think his take is really interesting. And then whatever the hell's going on with Age of X, X-Man, I don't care. It's it's garbage. But, um, hey, I've been, I've been following it. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, 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 I think if you see this in the store, you should pick it up and you know pretend like you're interested just to see the reaction on the LCA, the local comic shop uh uh, whoever is working there's face. Like you almost should go up to the front, and maybe you could be like, I haven't, I haven't read comics since, since the '90s. Like Rob Liefeld still making books. Like, like there's got to be a few bits, a bit ideas or a little, little uh, practical sort of Joker type moments there that you can do with this issue. But don't buy it. Don't encourage this kind of nonsense. If Liefeld were to come out with a new um, property of his own. Or if he was to totally reinvent his style, or if he was to – he's actually done some cool stuff. He lets uh, new up-and-coming uh, artists like uh, Brandon Graham and uh, Michael Fife, uh, I think that's how you say his name. Yeah, like, who take the some of his, court, yeah. Yeah, they take some of his old properties, and they get to reinvent them and do things. And I think that's amazing. I'm really – profit – we talked about that on the yeah, show. Yeah, and, and, and also writers too. I mean he, he had some you know really good work from Jim Zub. Uh, yes. with, with young blood. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So do that, do that all day. But like, it's don't... almost as if his like, he's good at the concept, but lousy at the execution, at the final execution. Even, this isn't even a good concept. Like, like this, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really shit. Like, it's just, it's almost like, I honestly, I don't know. I feel like it's like a dare or like a, he's so brazen and, or so ignorant of people's reaction to his style I mean, I'm sure there are I get people out there who love his stuff, but like yeah. But do you think also he may just be catering to what people expect with this one? Maybe I guess yeah. But wouldn't it be much more of an interesting story if he was able to like like reinvent himself? I but mean, does he are, really even have that in him? Oh, I don't think so at all. The subjects that we've mentioned, which have been really good stories, you know, Prophet and Prophet Earth War and. Uh, the the FIFA uh, Bloodstrike Bloodsport or whatever the fuck that was called, going back to Alan Moore Supreme, you know, th- there's some excellent executions of his concepts. I don't know if he necessarily has that in him. I don't know if he is able to do that reinvention. I think he may be stuck on the invention. I, I think you're right. Honestly, I think yeah. you're probably exactly right. But um, anyway, I yeah, and there's more to come. It's every two weeks, so, yeah. you know. Have fun with that. I mean, it's I'm like it's to... sad because if you ever read interviews with him or talk to him in person, he's so enthusiastic about the medium. Yeah, know, he's like a little puppy. Absolutely dog. So... loves comic books. Absolutely yeah. loves them. I get the criticisms of him. I don't get the criticisms of him personally. Well, he can be a little strident. No, no, he's very friendly, but he's also kind of an asshole online. So I get people who are pissed off about that, but. <laughs> All right, well, let's wrap it up with something a little more positive. Steve, what have you got? Uh, some horrible crap. No, I mean, uh, I've got, uh, you know, um, speaking of things that uh, that bring people joy, uh, Ahoy Comics. Um, it's brought me lots of joy. Uh, and just a couple of weeks ago, we were introduced to the first of the second wave series, and it was Bronze Age Boogie. Number one, uh, this one's written by Stuart Moore uh, and drawn by um, Alberto, and I'm going to get his last name, Alberto Ponticelli and uh, Julia Briscoe on colors. Um, again, this book is fantastic and wonderful. It's weird and crazy. Um, brings to mind, obviously, the Bronze Age of Comics is one of the you know inspirations, but also other things that take place in the 70s. Like disco and black exploitation, and um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say Planet of the Apes movies, uh, because there's a lot of uh, 
uh, talking chimp work here uh, in, on display. Um, but also, interestingly enough, it, it pulls some inspiration from Conan uh, and sort of the savage sort of Conan that, uh, you know, that era of, um, you know, barbarian swordplay kind of books with lots of magic and and fighting. Um, because most of the, of the first issue takes place uh, in the year, um, I want to say like, you know, 3000 BC or something like that, uh, where a roaming warrior band is fighting um, a bunch of zombies and dinosaurs uh, and zombie dinosaurs um, to overtake a castle run by wizards with a giant ruby. No explanation why. There's not really any need to. It's just, you know, that these barbarians need to defeat this army and they got to get through and defeat these wizards. Um, but it introduces us to two new characters, Britta Constantina, who is going to be uh, sort of our, our eyes and ears into the world of Bronze Age Boogie uh, and her father, King Dovel um, or uh, Donal Constantine. Um, and the one thing that, uh, that jumps right off the page uh, right away is that Moore has written uh, Britta to be very much, into 1970s slang. Uh, and she does, she seems to be speaking a little bit um, too hip, quote unquote, for her own good, or at least for the time period. Uh, while her dad sort of speaks in, you know, fake, grandiose, uh, you know, medieval speak, she's like, yeah, right on, or get it on, or whatever. You know, it's, um, it's pretty interesting. But uh, she also seems to have a friend who is a talking chimp, uh, from the far future, uh, and that far future seems to be a future of talking chimps uh, who have space programs and time machines and things like that, but have also uh, spent a lot of time in the 1970s. Um, <laughs> it's bizarre, it's strange, and uh, somehow she finds herself pulled into that future, uh, the far, far future of 1975, and that's kind of where we end the first issue um, comic section. And I have to say, it's a wild ride in about 20 pages worth of comic. Um, the characters are weird. We get a few glimpses of some of the other uh, people that we're going to be introduced in over the, the um, whole of this limited series. Um, and it's, it, it's just very creative and beautiful. I really like the art. I love the colors and I love the sort of, uh, bizarre uh, setup that Stuart Moore has given us. Okay. Um, the name of this podcast is Comic Book Bears. Shouldn't you mention the backup story? Uh, yes. So I was just <laughs> going to get to that. Um, like every Ahoy comic, uh, it's filled with a lot of back matter. And in fact, uh, Moore actually writes about this, um, that one of his biggest influences when he was younger uh, were the Marvel preview magazines. Um comic magazines and of course you know similar uh similar titles that have been put out that have you know comics but they also are filled with uh sort of like articles and essays and some other things and that's pretty much the the whole feel and aesthetic of ahoy comics has been since they started last year um and this does not disappoint but what he also does for the backup feature um is a <laughs> series uh that he has called uh is it Astro Bear? Major Ursa. Major Ursa. That's what it is. Um, it is uh, kind of ridiculous, but it kind of takes the um, the early days of the U.S. Uh, space program, and instead of dogs that they were using in the 50s and, and 60s, launching them into space to, uh, to see the effects of space on humans, or at least on mammals, before sending humans up, uh, instead they're sending bears up. And uh, in in great setup origin story fashion, um, you know, one of the lead scientists uh, really, really likes uh, one of the bears named Elvis um, and, uh, you know, is, is fighting for sort of some respect for, uh, you know, for her sign friend uh, from, you know, some naysayers in the Air Force who are just sort of like, what's with these stupid bears why keep using these experiments you know just send a human up out send me up um and sadly what she thinks she's doing is sending him on his last mission uh which would put him into orbit um and then afterwards he would be dissected even if he did survive poor elvis 
Um, and reluctantly, she sends them up, and the rocket, of course, hits some kind of radiation or magnetic storm, uh, putting the bear right back uh, towards Earth, in fact, coming right down um, in the space center. Uh, and as the smoke clears, the bear takes uh, his own helmet off and says, wow, that was one hell of a ride. So, of course, now we've got a talking bear um, who flies spaceships. Uh, I'm excited for this. These are just, you know, again, eight page backup stories. But given how enjoyable um, previous backup features have been and the fact that one of them, hashtag Danger, has uh, translated into a full limited series, um, we might be seeing more of Major Ursa uh, in the coming months or possibly uh, maybe in the third wave of comics. And it's fun. (laughs) I do have this book coming to me in my next box, and I'm very excited about it. I also did like what Kurt Busiek said the book should have been called, which is The Savage Sword of the Planet of the Deadly Hands of the Worlds on the Loose. Yes, yes. No, it's exactly it, because (laughs) in the first issue so far, it's introduced us to something that's, uh, you know, uh, Conan adjacent. Planet of the Apes adjacent, black exploitation adjacent with Bruce Lee and Coffee, uh, as well as um, War of the Worlds. Just thrown all in there together in a very confusing but beautiful and fun and goofy mess. And I'm really looking forward to issue number two. All right. Well, it's getting a bit late here, folks, so we're going to wrap this one up, and when we wrap an episode of The Comic Book Bears Up, we do so with a segment we call the Wolves of the Week segment, which is where we, and if you hear in the background, you can hear my partner Robert making fun of me. And (laughs) and, uh, what the Wolves of the Week is, is uh, something that we signify in the bear community. If we find a gentleman attractive, we woof. Makes no sense. Bears don't woof, but that's the way it is. So it's something be it a comic book or a film or a charitable initiative, anything under the sun that we think you, fair listener, may be interested in sampling. I would usually go to Steve first, but Brian, it's been so long since you've been with us. I'm going to throw it over to you first. What is your Wolf of the Week? So I have, like I said, not watched very many movies or television shows. However, my uh, my boyfriend, uh, Brandon, who I uh, have been seeing for a little while now, he uh, – Turn me on to an interesting show called Dark Tourist. Have you guys heard of this? It's on, I believe, Netflix. No. Uh, yes. Yes, I have. I have. All right. So it's uh, New Zealand, I think, uh, of origin, uh, at least the the main host. And basically, he is a travel, travel log, travel whatever host and goes to places that um, most people probably would avoid. Um, but have some more interesting and sort of what they would consider dark, like, you know, deadly people have died there or there's some dangers that might kill you, things like that. And the episode that I was that, – that Brandon sent me was one about Japan, and I spent about a month in Japan uh, in January, and I actually went to – to almost three of the places that he, uh, this tourist, this dark tourist show went to. Um, so I recommend it, A, just because uh, it's pretty cool to see stuff you've, you know, already experienced and sort of locales that you've, you've gotten to see, uh, rendered on, you know, a beautiful shot, uh, travel uh, show. But what's really fascinating is he goes to, uh, Fukushima. And that is, of course, uh, the, the area that had the tsunami and then the tsunami. Uh, caused a nuclear meltdown and that caused radiation to escape and is now basically like devastating that whole area uh, in that people had to leave. They had to just pick up and leave their houses, their jobs, everything. And there are tours that go through these areas, uh, at least the outskirts where it's eh, safe-ish. Uh, but anyway, there's, there's a whole segment there where they go through uh, and they have a Geiger counter and the guy's like, oh, point two is uh, probably as high or not point two. It's even lower than that. But anyway, let's say point two is as high as you want to go. If anything more than that, you could have some serious damage and, and, and issues. And of course, almost immediately in the tour, the thing is up to like point seven or some crazy. It's like like it already just blows through that limit and 
the host gets out and kind of sneaks around one of the arcades that had been abandoned. And again, having just been in Japan and seeing a lot of Japan, it's, it's a kind of similar sort of look and feel like you go to one town, you go to another. They're very similar in a lot of archetypal ways. And so seeing like the abandoned pachinko parlor, you know, with all this dust and just debris and just, uh, it's fascinating. Um, so yeah, I definitely recommend Dark Tourist. There's a couple other good episodes. One goes to like Crete, where there's some contested area between, uh, I think it's Crete and Turkey. Uh, that's, you're not supposed to go. Um, they have like a, a, a World War II reenactment troop he goes and is a part of, and you know involves people dressing up as Nazis and it's so yeah, just stuff like that. You, you, you if you're a you don't even have to be that macabre minded because it's pretty funny the way he presents it. But, you know, it, it can be some some intense stuff. Uh, and again, it's on Netflix called Dark Tourist. All right. Going over to Steve. Steve, what is your Wolf of the Week? Well, my Wolf of the Week is uh, kind of a uh, maybe a, a bookend to our last uh, episode's discussion about uh, Shazam. In that this past week, I actually went and saw Shazam a second time. Uh, but this time at a 4DX theater. Now, I, there's only 14 of these in the U.S. right now, uh, and a, you know, a handful of them in other countries. Uh, originally, I guess it's from South Korea. Um, but a 4DX theater is um, something that most people would be very familiar with if they've done any of the quote-unquote 4D amusement park rides like – you know, the Harry Potter ride and Universal or uh, even the Bugs Life, um, you know, movie event thing at Animal Kingdom in Orlando. Uh, it, it's very similar. Um, so you walk into the movie theater itself uh, and it actually it's only been open for less than a month in Charlotte um, at the Regal, Stu- uh, Regal Cinema there. Um, but, uh, every seat section, it's, you know, you're basically in sections of four seats, uh, that, uh, move together on a single sort of, uh, piston, uh, type thing. Um, and, uh, the seats do not recline. They're actually very stiff with a very sturdy lumbar support. Uh, and that's by design because within the back of the chair, there's a lot of sensors and, um, additional sort of, uh, moving parts uh, that are done for fight scenes and crashes and things like that, where you will be getting poked, prodded, bumped. It, it kind of feels like somebody's kicking your chair, but it's not somebody kicking your chair. It's somebody, it's your chair kicking you, basically, um, as well as, uh, you know, the seats moving up and down, uh, blasts of air uh, on your face and on your legs. Um, there is water, depending on the movie that you see, there might be, you know, a lot of potential spraying or not. Uh, there's also bubble making machines. There's fog machines. There's flashing lights. Uh, it is truly a movie ride, but when you go to see it, uh, in a movie theater and watching an action film or a superhero flick, like I did with Shazam, it becomes a two plus hour movie ride as opposed to the five minute, uh, to 10 minutes you'll usually get. Um, it's expensive. It cost me just about $25 for an evening ticket for uh, the middle of the week. But Shazam, again, with 4DX, was fun. It became a movie ride. Um, you know, lots of flashing lights every time that there was lightning effects on screen, which, of course, Shazam, there's tons of it. Uh, when uh, there is a scene where uh, a character gets stabbed in the back shoulder with a batarang, um, not to spoil anything, but uh, you actually do feel uh, what feels like somebody jabbing you uh, quite strongly in the, in the back shoulder, uh, you know, when that happens. Um, you know, you're, every time you're flying during uh, aerial fight scenes, your seats are buffeting all over the place. It's, it's a hell of a ride, and it was a lot of fun. So if you have the, uh, the luck of being anywhere near a 4DX theater, Give it a shot, especially with Avengers coming up. But be forewarned, uh, you are in for two to three hours of your seat jacking you around uh, somewhat strongly and a lot stronger than I thought it would. Um, so if you like those kinds of movie rides, perfect. If you think you can stand it for three hours, go for it. Um, pay a lot for it, but it's it's worth the ride. Okay. Well, my woof of the week goes to something much more lo-fi. 
And I'm going to throw it out to Crime Town Presents The Ballad of Billy Balls. It's a new podcast from the team of Crime Town, who also produced the HBO series The Jinx, The Lives and Deaths of Robert Durst. If you haven't seen that, it's amazing. The series is hosted by Io Tillett Wright, who is an activist and author. In the late 1970s, Rebecca Wright was an actress pounding the streets of New York. In 1977, she met a musician named Billy Balls, and they deeply fell in love. For seven years, the two of them made love, music, and art together in the East Village, until one day in the summer of 1982, Rebecca came home to find her windows blown out and Billy gone. It turns out he was shot seven times without any explanation, and his body sat for ten days in Cabrini Hospital and then was mysteriously taken to an anonymous burial ground that she cannot find to this day. For 34 years, Rebecca has lived as a widow and to this day has never properly said goodbye. It's unknown why Billy was disappeared, if this was a cover-up, and most importantly, who killed Billy. I love my true crime podcast. This one is exceptionally well done. It just started. We're only on the fourth episode. And there was a moment at the end of the second episode where I literally gasped. It was not a connection I anticipated making. If you're familiar with the CBGB's downtown New York scene of the late 70s into the early 80s, this is an effectively unknown tale that fits within that narrative. And I'm really interested to see where this goes. Uh, again, that is Crime Town Presents the Ballad of Billy Balls. All right, we're wrapping this one up for good, Brian. It's so great to have you back, man. So great. Yeah, I, I really felt bad every time I would be like, I can't <laughs> yeah. do it. I'm yeah. in another area code, yeah. you know time zone and i know it's really bad when we like even stopped asking you because we're like oh no he hasn't seen shazam you know no. <laughs> there's no yeah, way that's happening <laughs> i wish like you think you have a lot of time but no i'm i'm really happy to be back and uh you know with things slowing down a bit i hope to have a little bit more of a regular presence well, nice to hear all right, wrapping this up for good now. This is the Comic Book Bears podcast. You can find us on the Twitter and the Tumblr and the Instagram as Comic Book Bears. You can find us on the Facebook as Comic Book Bears podcast. If you want to write to us, you can do so by sending an email to comicbookbears at gmail.com. You can subscribe to us through iTunes. You can listen to us through Stitcher Radio and catch us on some of the other podcatching websites. Until next time, I'm Billy Z. Steve. <laughs> I'm Steve Morey. <laughs> and I'm Brian Pittard. I you prefer get... <laughs> that. <laughs> You're going to hear a woof and an explosion. We'll be back real soon. Take care, everyone. Woof! Teenage gamblers sitting in a rambler Listening to the radio And then standing in the grandstands Following the game plan Watching life's plays unfold